Auditorium at the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design for our uh, March 8th edition of the Spring 2021 Public Lecture Series of the School. We will take a minute or two while our auditorium fills. I see it already filling rapidly and well, uh, but we will um, start in just a couple minutes. So uh, please continue to enjoy your end of afternoon or early evening beverage, wherever you are. Uh, settle in for what uh, we are all sure will be a wonderful uh, presentation uh, by Teddy Cruz and Fono Foreman. But uh, again, a couple minutes still uh, while we wait for a little bit more audience seating to fill. Typically, we try to ensure a, a strong audience uh, of listening in. We know that we're joined not only by members of the Faye Jones School community, faculty, students, and staff, but our alumni are able to join us from really across the nation. Um, we uh, are also joined, I know, by uh, many from across the University of Arkansas itself. And, uh, Increasingly, we are having audience attendees by virtue of our partnership with Places Online Journal um, beyond the US even. But let's just give another minute or two for the uh, 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 participation to rise just slightly. We wanna begin no later than five minutes past the hour. Uh, Byron, I'll look to you for my cue for the formal, truly formal start. And while we're waiting for seating to fill uh, in the uh, interest of, of public service, um, announce for those at least who are listening in Arkansas that the uh, Governor Hutchinson has uh, announced already today that the state's vaccination programs <laughs> are being extended through Group 1B, uh, which includes not only everyone across the university, but increasingly people out in the food service, grocery stores, food manufacturing, uh, and so forth. So uh, there is uh, beginning to be some momentum um, here in the state for that. And we are seeing benefits of this already uh, on the university campus. Byron, how are we? Are we at 405? Yes, sir. All right. Well. We also have already received greetings from Vancouver, Canada. So with that uh, outreach assured, uh, perhaps it's time to begin uh, more formally. Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, my name is Peter McKeith. I'm the Dean of the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design at the University of Arkansas. Uh, and uh, I welcome you to our virtual auditorium for this March 8th edition of the school's Spring 2021 Public Lecture Series. You'll hear more about the Public Lecture Series in a moment or two from our Lecture Series Coordinator, Assistant Professor Brian Holland, and you'll hear more about this afternoon's lecturers, Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman, uh, from Professor and Head of the Department of Architecture, John Folan. Uh, but as we begin, I would like to orient us uh, to the extent possible um, by presenting to you this uh, uh, a golden image uh, looking south uh, across the uh, main campus of the University of Arkansas, south across the two towers of Old Main, uh, the School of Architecture and Design itself off to the right and south across into the Boston Mountains and the Ozark Plateau more generally. And while this is a welcome to campus and a welcome to the school, it is also an important opportunity for us as a school and as a university to acknowledge uh, the responsibility, the legacy, the obligation we have uh, to those tribal communities who have occupied this land uh, well before our arrival uh, and need to be acknowledged now at the outset of every 
public program event for the school. So I'd like to begin formally with a land acknowledgement statement and then move from there to Brian Holland and further introductions. The indigenous history of the land the University of Arkansas campus sits on goes back to time immemorial. And across that expanse of time, many successive groups have lived here and created sacred legacies in this area. The Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design acknowledges indigenous peoples were forced to leave their ancestral lands, including the Osage, Caddo, and Quapaw nations with ties to Northwest Arkansas. We further recognize that a portion of the Trail of Tears runs through our campus and that the Cherokee, Choctaw, Muscogee or Creek, Chickasaw and Seminole nations passed through what is now Arkansas during this forced removal. We acknowledge all indigenous teachers, researchers and all other residents in our community and region today. We seek continuity and connection to the past as we look to the future with increased collaboration with indigenous governments and entities. We say to the citizens of indigenous nations, we see you and we thank you. Now with that, I also uh, would like to acknowledge and thank uh, our affiliations and partnerships across the university and across the nation. We're very privileged to be joined in this lecture series by the University of Arkansas Office for Diversity and Inclusion. We're equally pleased to be uh, partnered with Places Online Journal for Architecture, Landscape Architecture and Urbanism. And we're very pleased uh, uh, to recognize uh, the generosity of Fayetteville citizens, Ken and Liz Allen, and their support of this lecture series, both last fall and this spring. Thank you, one and all. With that, I'd like to ask Assistant Professor Brian Holland to introduce us to the lecture series and upcoming events. Brian. Thank you, Dean McKeith. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Holland, and I coordinate the school's public lecture series. As the semester advances, we continue with a series of exciting programs, lectures, workshops, and a symposium that are intended to help us continue interrogating the roles that design students, educators, and professionals can play in shaping the spaces of a more equitable and just future. In a time of great collective urgency, what projects, histories, and ideas have shaped the built environment as we now know it, and what concepts, critiques, and practices must we consider in our own determined efforts to improve it? We continue the series this afternoon with a lecture by distinguished visiting professors, Teddy Cruz and Fana Foreman. Professor John Folin will provide an introduction to their lecture in just a moment. But first, I wanna give a short preview of what's next up in our series. Beginning next Monday, March 15, and continuing to the following Monday, March 22nd, the Phaedron School will host Piggybacking Practices, a symposium on architecture and inequality. This two-part symposium will be accompanied by an online exhibition and will assemble some of today's most innovative architects, urban designers, and scholars for a two-part conversation exploring piggybacking practices in relation to contemporary forms of inequality in the built environment. The symposium will kick off on March 15th with an examination of common piggybacking tactics, such as niche and habitation, resource sharing, and waste stream capture, and will ask how these tactics can be leveraged in support of larger strategic aims. The second session on March 22nd will explore the emancipatory potentials of piggybacking practices in relation to the wider discourse around advocacy and activism in architecture and urban design. Please visit the website piggybackingpractices.com as well as our own Faye Jones School lecture page for more details and to view the online ex exhibition which launches in a few days. Lastly, please also know this symposium will require a separate Zoom registration to attend. So a separate registration from the one you use to register for this series. You will only need to register once to attend both sessions. And again, the registration link can be found at the website um, piggybackingpractices.com or the school lecture page. You can also find detailed information about each of the participants on both of these websites. So I very much hope you'll join us again next week for that event. After the symposium, the lecture series will again continue on March 29th with a lecture by Mia Lehrer. She's the founder and director of the LA-based practice Studio MLA that integrates landscape architecture and urban design. 
And lastly, Pascal Sablon, founder of Beyond the Built Environment and the creator of the Say It Loud exhibition series, will deliver the final lecture of our series, discussing her efforts at highlighting contributions to the design of the built environment by women architects and architects of color. So thank you for being with us today. And again, on behalf of the Phaedron School, Places Journal, and the U of A's Division for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, we look forward to seeing you again for each of these upcoming events. Now a brief note from Byron McEwen about tonight's Q&A. Hello all <clears throat> and welcome. Just a reminder that if you have any questions for our lecturers, we do have a dedicated portion at the end, so please submit them using the Q&A feature. We ask that you use the Q&A feature, not the chat, because it allows our moderators to keep up with them better and to group them uh, in a more coherent fashion. Uh, as far as the continuing education credits go, again, these do not apply to students. Please, students, do not send me your um, student ID numbers. Um, we only need AIA numbers for those seeking um, the learning credits, which this has been approved for, as well as uh, the lectures are always recorded and they are made available first to students and faculty and then to the public generally thereafter. Hope you all enjoy. Thank you, Byron. Now I turn it over to Professor John Folan for an introduction to this afternoon's distinguished speakers. Thank you, Brian. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce this year's John G. Williams Distinguished Professors, Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman, principals in a studio, Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman. Um, they run a research-based uh, political and architectural practice based in San Diego, California. Today, social justice is a part of our discourse as designers. That wasn't always the case. We've needed people with vision to see the way and address causes far away from the spotlight. The work of um, uh, Cruz and Foreman uh, addresses issues of informal urbanization, civic infrastructure, and public culture with a special emphasis on Latin American cities. Efforts blur conventional boundaries between theory and practice, merge the fields of architecture and urbanism, political theory and urban policy, visual arts, and public culture. They have led numerous urban research agendas globally, but they're realists. They're realists with boots on the ground, firmly planted on the ground, having implemented civic and public interventions of all form and scale. Most notably and prolifically in the San Diego Tijuana border region. They've had sustained impact in that region and have demonstrated what it is to be a citizen architect or a citizen practice. Cruz and Foreman have exhibited widely at MoMA in New York, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, at the House of Culture der Welt in Berlin, and at the M Plus in Hong Kong. In 2018, they represented the United States at the Venice Architecture Biennale. In addition, <clears throat> in addition to authoring the informal market world's reader, The Architecture of Economic Pressure, they have two forthcoming monographs on their work, one top down, bottom up, and the other, The Political Equator, Unwalling Citizenship, which you'll hear a bit more about uh, in the lecture this evening. Um, we've been privileged to have them uh, with us this, this semester, expanding their political equator work to include Arkansas. Working with 15 students and Assistant Professor Brian Holland, uh, they are investigating central issues to urbanization here deepening social and economic inequality, dramatic migratory shifts, urban informality, climate change, and the decline of public thinking. Using their own words, they are localizing the global. Please join me in welcoming Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for that introduction. And thank you to Peter McKeith, for what was really a moving um, start to this event with the land acknowledgement statement, Teddy and I are sitting ourselves on unceded Kumeyaay land. Very meaningful. Um, and, um, and we've just enjoyed so much working with Brian Holland over the past um, uh, half semester. Uh, it's been just a, a pleasure. And we only wish we were with you uh, at the university in person. Um, but we're very excited to be here with you uh, tonight to discuss our research-based practice embedded at the San Diego-Tijuana border. Um, 
we really see this zone um, as a microcosm of all of the injustices and indignities experienced by vulnerable people across the globe. Political violence, climate disruption, accelerating migration, rising nationalism, border building everywhere, deepening inequality and the steady decay of public thinking. We live and work a few miles away from the child detention centers that will forever stain this period of American history. San Diego, Tijuana has become a lightning rod for American nativism. And though the news cameras are gone, tens of thousands of Central American migrants wait at the wall for asylum that never comes, reviled by the Mexican public as a nuisance, an infestation, the language is terrible, or else they sit in US detention centers as tools of deterrence, separated forcibly from their children and exposed to a raging pandemic. It has been particularly devastating in recent years to witness the emotional impact on children, their fear and the inevitable psychic internalization of being socially and morally marginalized. Hopefully there's relief on the horizon. It remains to be seen, but the, the prospect of more border porosity is you know, drawing even more people northbound uh, right now with misinformation circulating on social media. Conditions are really intensifying here every day and climate change will inevitably make things worse and accelerate these flows in the years to come. A recent United Nations survey found that 72% of arriving migrants at our Southern border are agricultural workers and that agricultural instability was a major factor in their decision to walk north. Global justice is an intensely local experience here. But against these local atrocities, border communities and activists on both sides of the wall continue to confront and productively circumvent unjust power. Some of this contestation is working through sanctuary and protecting people targeted by the state. Some of it is working through the courts, the detention centers and other institutions of power to advocate for people already ensnared in the net of political violence. Some of it takes the shape of bottom-up civic agency, you know, that exposes and counters unjust power, confronts hateful political narratives and transgresses boundaries. Much of it arrives, arises informally through everyday collective practices of adaptation and resilience in conditions of scarcity and danger. Over the years, Teddy and I have accompanied some of this bottom up emancipatory transgression and eruptions of democratic will in close partnership with agencies at the front lines. In recent years, these struggles have also attracted artists and cultural producers from around the world to engage in acts of performative protest. We've been largely critical of this uptick in ephemeral cultural action that sort of dips in and out of the conflict. It tends to be extractive in its processes and the impact on public consciousness as fleeting as the Instagram posts it generates. What happens you know, the day after the happening? Instead, we have been advocating for a longer view of resistance, a more systemic approach to the drivers of injustice and more strategic thinking about cultural, institutional and spatial transformation in the border region. These commitments have culminated in a project that we would like to share with you tonight, the UCSD Community Stations essentially a network of public spaces located in vulnerable neighborhoods across the border region where universities and communities meet to share knowledges and resources and collaborate on research, dialogue, cultural and educational activities as well as urban design build projects, you know, projects actually in the city. The community stations are the field-based social engagement arm of our research-based practice, which is based inside of the University of California, San Diego, where we teach. So here we are with our team um, and some of our community uh, partners in Tijuana just before COVID-19 hit. We have several core commitments um, that comprise a sort of community stations model 
which we think is highly replicable uh, for universities everywhere. I will introduce these commitments. Teddy will then take you on a tour of our four UCSD community station sites. And then I will come back and conclude with a few words about our programming at the sites and how they link our local border context here with sites of conflict across the world. So to begin, we localize the global. John mentioned this earlier. We've always resisted the idea that global justice is, justice is something that happens out there somewhere, out there in the world. Living and working where we do, we don't need to send our students far away to learn about territorial conflict, migration, poverty, climate justice. We are you know, minutes away from an international border in crisis. And this enables an amazing proximity between campus and field, between theory and practice, what we think of as a, a kind of critical proximity. Of course, going local here means recognizing ourselves as a region a site of interdependence. Despite the wall and the ugly political rhetoric designed to divide us, we are a binational ecology of flows and circulation. And our future here is intertwined. Air, water, waste, health, culture, money, hope, love. These things don't stop at walls. We build trust bridges long-term partnerships between our university and border communities. We're not like sort of flaky university programs that come and go, you know, diagnosing a crisis, extracting data, and then disappearing. We don't disappear. We're there for the long haul. We decolonize knowledge. We are keenly attuned to power dynamics when universities arrive in communities. And we're critical of both extractive research methods and humanitarian problem solving missions. We don't do applied research and we don't do charity. We are not a service learning program. Academic culture is filled with assumptions that we know more, that we are trained to solve the world's problems if only they would listen to us, right? All vertical ideas. We've been committed to horizontal practices of co-production, engaging communities as partners with knowledges and resources and agency. Everyone contributes, everyone learns, and together we do things in the city that no one could do alone. Along these lines, universities too often take for granted the resources that communities invest when they work with us, time, space, social capital, labor, and knowledge. As a matter of epistemic justice and labor equity, these contributions always need to be validated and compensated. We curate two-way flows, inside out and outside in, unsiloing our campus and inviting activists and community leaders to teach with us inside the university, ultimately thinking outside the box, literally, for what it means for a university to commit to diversity. Cultivating skills of cultural sensitivity, empathy, and awesome respect. These are skills that are best learned in C2. Today's challenges demand intersectionality, but everything that we do on migration, climate change, environment, health, labor, education, urbanization is refracted through the lens of social transformation. For us, it's always about changing hearts and minds, tackling inequality by increasing public knowledge about the roots and springs of injustice and growing connected, civically engaged border communities capable of collective action, advocacy, and productive contestation. Ultimately, we've been committed to building a cross-border citizenship culture a sense of belonging that is defined not by the nation state or the documents in one's pocket, but by the shared interests and aspirations among people who share, who inhabit a violently and also artificially disrupted civic space. 
Those who benefit from narratives of separation and mistrust prefer that we remain a fragmented public and that the idea of citizenship divides us rather than unites us. We, you know, we seek to inspire more inclusive imaginaries of coexistence and cross-border citizenship in this contested territory. Our cultural aspirations are inspired by Paulo Freire and Augusto Boal and a 20th century lineage of Latin American civic experimentation and urban pedagogy. In contexts of dramatic violence and social fragmentation, cities like Porto Alegre, Brazil, and Bogota and Medellin, Colombia, sought to heal the wounds of history and mobilize a cohesive civic identity through participatory civic action. The way Antanas Mokus, for example, in Bogota, used street mimes, urban games, and theatrical public disruptions to transform urban norms from the bottom up, or the way Medellin, Colombia, transformed urban remainders in forgotten zones into vibrant, vibrant civic spaces that prioritized access and education. Like Medellin's now legendary library parks, our community stations represent a model of urban co-development between public universities and community organizations to fight the creeping gentrification of border neighborhoods. Each station is designed, funded, built, programmed, and maintained collaboratively between the campus uh, and the community. And finally, we reject conventional strategies of urban beautification and innovation that turn our cities and our public spaces into sites of leisure and consumption. We question the agendas of the creative class and their pop-ups, which too often accelerate gentrification, appropriate arts and culture as tools uh, uh, for private ends, and become an apology really for the absence of more substantial public investment in the city. We believe public space must become civicized, to use James Tully's beautiful concept, a site of dialogue and contestation and infused with resources and tools to increase public knowledge and community capacity for political and environmental action. So now a tour of the UCSD community stations and just a hint about what goes on inside of these spaces. So for us, um, urban justice is a distributed, uh, distributive concept requiring not only the redistribution of resources, but also the redistribution of knowledges. We design this re reciprocal knowledge infrastructure as both a collaborative education platform and a model of shared urban intervention. We claimed that the economic and programmatic power of our public university can be leveraged for communities to develop their own public spaces and social housing. As a distributed system of public spaces transgressing the wall, the community stations specialize social justice, mobilizing cross-border citizenship culture through cultural action. With our community partners, we have co-developed four community stations, two in San Diego, two in Tijuana. So let us move from North uh, to South. The UCSD Earth Lab community station is a partnership with Grand World San Diego, an environmental justice nonprofit located in the low-income, primarily Black and Latinx neighborhood of Encanto, a community characterized by high unemployment, low educational attainment, food insecurity, and cyclical poverty. The station occupies a four-acre vacant parcel owned by the San Diego Unified School District, who granted the parcel to our partnership to increase educational capacity for the eight public schools within walking distance of the site. The goal? was to prom promote circulations between traditional classroom-based learning and outdoor experiential learning. This access to municipal land gave us leverage to assemble a unique cross-sector collaboration between a major research university, a local school district, and a grassroots organization to co-develop public, public space, placing education at the center of community development. Before COVID-19 hit, 3,000 kids and their families circulated through the Earth Lab each year. And during the current transition, it continues to operate as an outdoor socially distanced classroom. Recently, the school district committed capital monies toward a more uh, refined physical resolution of the site 
for, a, for what has been so far a largely informal effort. While UCSD, our public university, will invest in sustainable educational programming, research and management in collaboration with Grand Work San Diego, our community partners who will steward community participation. Pedagogic zones at the site will be focused on habitat restoration through energy, water, food, community programs, all wrapped by indigenous Kumeyaay knowledges and environmental practices. Ultimately, the UCSD Earth Lab Community Station will perform as an open air climate action park designed for environmental education and climate justice. The district has also committed school bond funding for a new climate action design building to anchor this, the site and also as a pilot for post-COVID porosity in classroom design. This station will break ground in 2022. Moving south, the UCSD Casa Community Station is a partnership with the nonprofit Casa Familiar, a 30-year-old community-based social service organization. It is located in the border neighborhood of San Isidro, site uh, of the busiest land crossing in the Western Hemisphere. The community is 90% Latinx and has one of the highest unemployment rates, lowest median household income, and worst air quality in San Diego County. The heart of this community station is a beloved historic church that sat for de decades in disrepair and which we are able now to rescue through this project. During construction, uh, the building had to be lifted for installing new foundations. During the times of so much political violence inflicted on this border community, the surreal image of the church levitating with uh, Tijuana's informal settlements in the distance inspired a sense of hope uh, for the local residents. With the adaptive reuse of this historic church, um, uh, this building, as catalyst, we designed the UCSD Casa Community Station as a double project. A parcel size social infrastructure made of spaces for cultural and economic activity is flanked by affordable housing. The organizational design of the parcel through a system of linear uh, stripes with a variety of small scale buildings performing different roles was also a deliberate, a deliberate strategy to mobilize diverse financial streams to fund the different building typologies. Leveraging programmatic investments by the an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to support the educational, cultural, and research programming and circulations between the university and the community, Casa Familiar and UCSD secured capital investments by the Park Foundation and Art Place America to build the social service infrastructure. These investments in turn enable Casa Familiar to qualify for a $9 million new market tax credit development package facilitated by the local municipality. So Casa Familiar, our partners, uh, have become now an alternative developer for affordable housing for its own community of San Isidro and public space was the detonator. We renovated the historic church into a community theater with an outdoor stage. This performance uh, space is flanked on one side by a series of small accessory buildings for Casa Familiar social programming, and on the other side by an open air uh, civic classroom pavilion. This uh, social, educational, and cultural infrastructure anchors 10 units of affordable housing at both ends of the parcel, all mediated by pedestrian walkways. We never imagined that this choreography of indoor and outdoor spaces would become a community asset during a global pandemic. Ultimately, the project advances a reproducible prototype for a small scale development in other low income neighborhoods in San Diego, where buildings collaborate to transform small lots into social housing infrastructures. We completed construction of this station in February, just before COVID-19 hit and the residents moved in. It's all locked down now, but uh, it's a, a site uh, built for social proximity and we cannot wait to return in person with programming. But it's important to say that affordable housing here takes on a different meaning when it is deliberately threaded into spaces for social programming, summoning residents to participate in the development of local economy and cultural production, synergizing spaces, 
programs, resources, and people. This is what we call an integrated social spatial system that is programmed between the university and the community. Let's imagine a small coalition of local artists, promotoras, activists, and neighborhood youth collaborating with university-based curators, theater script writers, and visual artists who come together periodically to co-produce a play that explores an urgent issue facing the community enacted by local youth in the community theater. These artistic productions are rooted in neighborhood stories and become bottom-up evidentiary material to increase public knowledge and, and po uh, policy transformation. Before moving across the border, allow me to pause for a moment to summarize a couple of concepts and share how these processes behind our two San Diego-based stations exemplify several core commitments or building blocks as we call them in our own practice. In conditions of poverty, housing needs to be embedded in an infrastructure of social, economic, and cultural support. In other words, we must rethink affordable housing from autonomous units into relational social systems. Housing must be public infrastructure. Density should not be measured as an abstract number of objects or people per area. Density must be understood instead as the intensity of social and economic exchanges per area. Migrant neighborhoods have taught us that these exchanges mobilized by bottom-up urbanization is truly the DNA for democratizing the city in more, uh, into more inclusive and plural environments. Zoning must, be sto uh, must stop being punitive, preventing socialization. Instead, it should be conceptualized as a generative tool that anticipates, stimulates, and organizes social and economic activity in neighborhoods. The developer's performa is architecture's financial plastic. Inside the mathematics of this spreadsheet, our services as architects amount to 15% of a project's construction costs. This undercapitalized asset can be mobilized as collateral for development. Nothing should prevent us architects from becoming developers of our own projects. And by association, nothing should prevent communities from doing the same. So the sweat equity of architects, cultural producers and community leaders, the economic equity of public universities and municipal protocols for accessing public parcels can all be bundled, aggregated to enable communities to develop their own neighborhoods. And truly that's, that has been our story. So now moving across uh, the border, our two community stations in Tijuana are located in the Laureles Canyon an informal settlement adjacent to the border wall. I will take a few moments to describe this incredible context. This location is at an important juncture of conflict. Here, the topography of Tijuana's canyons clash with the border wall before spilling northbound into an environmentally protected estuary in San Diego, which is now layered with security infrastructure. At this hotspot, the conflict between natural and jurisdictional systems and between ecological and political priorities is profound. As we zoom in further, we witness a collision between the estuary in the US, the border wall and the informality of Laureles Canyon, which is home to 92,000 people. This aerial video shows Laureles Canyon and the precarious condition of the informal settlement that has a sprawl on the slopes. This site sits 30 minutes from our campus and demonstrates the dramatic proximity of wealth and extreme poverty in our region. Laureles Canyon is impacted by dump sites, drastic erosion, flooding and landslides, and all of this is exacerbated by the dramatic precipitation and fluctuations of climate change. Because Laureles Canyon lacks water and waste management infrastructure to mitigate these impacts, much of the trash along with tons of sediment flows upstream ending in the estuary in San Diego, contaminating this bioregional shared by national asset. Here, the border wall is an artifact of environmental um, insecurity. This is a trash that ends in the, um, in the estuary. These impacts have intensified in recent years because of a profound lack of collaboration between San Diego and Tijuana to manage 
these cross-border flows. In the last decades, 70% of the open lands in Laureles Canyon have been lost to irregular urban growth. We have been identifying, researching, and bundling on squatted lands in the settlement that are still environmentally rescuable to shape an archipelago of conservation. We are now, in fact, advancing an ambitious regional project called the Cross-Border Commons, an environmental conservation initiative that links the estuary in the US with the informal settlement in Mexico, forming a continuous social and ecological envelope that transgresses the wall and protects the environmental systems shared between these two border cities. With our partners uh, in Tijuana, uh, we are curating a coalition of state and municipal agencies, grassroots organizations, and universities on both sides of the wall. And we are now negotiating with the municipality in Tijuana to gain access to the remaining public lands inside the informal settlement. Another important contextual note before I introduce you to the Tijuana stations is uh, that the Laureles Canyon uh, has also been the site where we have advanced our research on informal urbanization. As we have written about over many years, the informal settlements of Tijuana are built with urban waste from San Diego, recycling architectural parts to construct habitation and infrastructure. We have learned a great, a great deal from these incremental building practices as people construct their own shelter in layers over time. In a case study we documented uh, before, a metal frame appeared one, from one day to another. In a couple of months, recycled materials from San Diego began to thread the spaces in the next weeks, an informal house emerged. We have also taken note that multinational uh, factories or maquiladoras surrounding these informal settlements typically benefit from easy access to cheap labor. Over the years, we have experimented with factory-made material systems to structurally mediate the, uh, the recycling of waste. Because Tijuana is a city of multinational factories that prey on cheap labor, we have proposed an ethical loop where factories invest in emergency housing. Here, we are inside Mecalux, a Spanish factory, a Spanish maquiladora that produces lightweight metal shelving systems for global export. Adapting its prefabricated systems into structural scaffolds as armatures for informal housing. We designed a catalog with the factory's engineers to test a variety of prototypes and configurations. The first Mechalux typology is shown here with adapted recycled urban waste from San Diego, illustrating how top-down institutional resources can support the bottom-up creative intelligence of informal urbanization. A couple of years ago, we built the first example, uh, and to tell you the truth, <laughs> being inside the factory, redirecting its material systems and surplus value to, sets, to sites of emergency was an important milestone in our research-based practice in the last years. We then worked with our community partners to build early applications to demonstrate to the community the adaptability of the system, such as this small bus stop to shelter Laureles workers from the sun. It was, it was important to introduce you briefly to these contextual processes because our two community stations in Tijuana operate within this um, rich e ecology of social, environmental, economic, and material relations and partnerships. Now to the stations themselves. The UCSD Alacran community station is located in the most rugged, precarious, and polluted south basin of the canyon. It is a partnership with Embajadores de Jesus, a religious organi organization led by activist pastor economist Gustavo Banda and pastor psychologist Zaida Guillén. With limited resources, Embajadores began constructing a refugee camp to provide shelter, food, and basic services to hundreds of Haitian and Central American refugees while they navigate on just asylum processes in the US and Mexico. And with the help of skilled migrant uh, labor, they began building their own emergency housing. We have established a long-term uh, partnership to co-develop a community station here to increase refugee housing capacity. We are accelerating production of the Mechalux frames 
to install them on vernacular post and beam concrete systems uh, into a housing infrastructure. The housing scaffolds will be built first, leaving the interiors as planned open systems equipped with utilities to support incremental live work configurations. These envelopes are the seeds for an evolving sanctuary neighborhood to be infilled through time by the migrant residents themselves. We see immigrant housing as a mechanism for generating jobs. To sustain the construction processes over time, we are designing a, what we call a sanctuary economy. We embed refugee housing in spaces of fabrication, training, small scale economic development. With the support of the Park Foundation, we have assembled a community owned business, the Little Haiti Construction Cooperative with the two library, wood and metal uh, fabrication machines and a couple of trucks and tractors. They will complete the construction of the site and remain operational for future construction jobs across the informal settlement. The UCSD Alacran Community Station began construction last summer with seed capital provided by New York-based philanthropist Robert Rubin and Stefan Samuel, whose collaboration on this project expands their commitment to the prefabricated social housing logics of post-war French architect Jean Prouvet. And finally, our UCSD Divina Community Station. This station is a partnership with Colonos de Divina Providencia, a Tijuana-based NGO that is rooted in the community of Divina. The nonprofit facilitates a variety of social services, including meals for youth, senior services, medical assistance, and environmental awareness. Using the Mechalux factory parts, the station takes the shape of a flexible scaffold to accommodate a variety of informal programs, including flea markets, cultural events, and a series of multi-level spaces to accommodate a small high school all curated between UCSD and our partners. At the Divina Station, we work with community leaders, students and researchers on social protection from landslides, floods, and estuary health beyond the wall. We lead educational programming through which young people understand zones of vulnerability in their own neighborhoods, emphasizing ecological conservation of species and habitat restoration. It's never too early to begin. We have committed here to elevating children as the cross-border citizens of the future. Our two Tijuana-based stations have also advanced important building blocks for our practice, two in particular. For us, the informal is not just an aesthetic category, but a praxis, a dynamic set of functional urban operations from below that counter and transgress the imposition of top-down political power and exclusionary economic models. Hospitality is the first gesture when the immigrant arrives, an essential charitable opening, a first step in creating a more welcoming society. But as needs become more complex over time, charity is not the appropriate model for building an inclusive society. We need to move from hospitality to inclusion. Thinking, shelter, uh, thinking beyond shelter is the foundation for rethinking refugee camps everywhere, from places of short-term habitation and service provision to durable infrastructures of inclusion. Migrant shelters can be agile for negotiating both transition and rootedness, the ephemeral and the permanent. So these are the four UCSD community stations. There's so much more to say about them, about our amazing partners and what we do together um, in these spaces. While all the stations focus on different issues reflecting the priorities of each neighborhood, they are all richly curated for dialogue, collaborative research, urban pedagogy, participatory design build and cultural production. They all aspire to increase public knowledge, challenge divisive political narratives, foster solidarity and collective agency, and advance strategies to counter exploitation, dispossession, deportation, and environmental calamity. These activities often invite encounters with formal institutions of power that govern the border zone. 
sometimes these meetings facilitate mutual recognition and cooperation, and sometimes they don't. For us, the goal is less about resolving conflict than about understanding, recognizing, and democratizing it. We see democracy in the border zone as a fundamentally bottom-up process of exposing and rendering more accessible the complex histories and mechanisms of injustice that are too often hidden within official accounts of who we are. Racist political narratives in the United States portray the border as a site of rupture and criminality. But we're committed to generating different stories here, counter narratives that are grounded in the experience of, uh, you know, experiences of, of those who inhabit it. We are a region of flows and circulations, shared practices and aspirations, alliances of hearts and minds, regardless of the wall that restricts the movement of our bodies. In this sense, the community stations become a cross-border observatory, a platform for constructing what we call an elastic civic identity from the bottom up a cross-border race publica. With our partners, we curate unwalling experiments that dissolve the wall using visual tools like diagrams and radical cartographies to situate border neighborhoods within broader spatial ecologies of circulation and interdependence from local to regional to continental and ultimately to global scales. We see elasticity as a, as a kind of civic skill the ability to stretch and return between local and more expansive ways of thinking over and again to understand one's challenges within broader dynamics and processes and to envision opportunities for solidarity and collective action beyond walls. Here at the border, the idea of a bioregion, you know, the binational watershed system has been a powerful imaginary for cultivating more elastic civic thinking. Several years ago, we curated a cross-border public action through one of the sewage drains that Homeland Security carved into the wall between Laurelis Canyon and the Tijuana River estuary that Teddy introduced you to earlier. We negotiated a permit with Homeland Security to transform the drain into an official port of entry going southbound for 24 hours. They agreed, they were sort of disarmed by our self-representation as just artists, as long as Mexican immigration officials were waiting on the other side to stamp our passports. Our convoy was comprised of 300 local activists, residents, representatives from both municipalities, San Diego and Tijuana, and artists and border activists from around the world. We summoned agencies who are typically at odds with one another. As we moved southbound under the wall, we witnessed slum wastewater flowing northbound toward the estuary beneath our feet. This strange crossing from estuary to slum through a militarized culvert and the stamping of passports on the other side amplified the most profound interdependencies of our border region. The great insight here was that protecting the vulnerable US estuary demands shared investment in the informal Mexican settlement. So in this cultural experiment, we went down, but sometimes nurturing civic elasticity requires ascending above the familiar. In the early 20th century, Patrick Geddes designed the Camera Obscura at the center of Edinburgh, a five story observation tower that enabled people to look out across the region and comprehend the environmental systems that organize it. He coined the term regionalism. For Geddes, it was essential to do this in order to construct a civic identity and a collective political will. Now, imagine a Mexican child standing on a narrow sliver of land above the Laurelis Canyon, hundreds of feet above the wall, uh, hundreds of feet above the border wall, right at this spot here, at a place called Mirador. Imagine she plants her feet facing due west with the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean in front of her, Mexico to her left, and the US to her right. Below to her immediate left, she sees the dense informal settlement where she lives. She can spot her house, her school, and experience their proximity to a country that she and her family are not allowed to enter. Below to her immediate right, almost directly beneath her feet, 
she sees the border wall, which from this vantage looks like a flimsy and ridiculous strip inserted onto a vast and powerful natural system. Lifting her eyes, she sees the green expanse of the estuary with its vulnerable wetland habitats and sediment basins that have been contrived to catch the northbound flow of trash from her community. And further beyond still, you can't see it in this image, she sees San Diego, downtown San Diego, rising vertically into the sky. From this vantage, all of the characters of this contested zone come to life. We've witnessed this moment of recognition again and again over the years, among children, our students, policymakers, even foundation presidents. There are few places on earth, we believe, where the collision of informality, militarization, environmental vulnerability, and the proximity of wealth and poverty can be so vividly experienced. But in reality, the conflicts that we experience here locally between nation and nature are reproduced again and again across the entire trajectory of the continental border between the United States and Mexico. Over the years, we've collected aerial photos like these that document precise moments when the jurisdictional line collides with natural systems, powerfully illustrating what dumb sovereignty looks like when it hits the ground in a complex bioregion. Our Mexus project stretches our elastic civic aspirations to the continental scale. Mexus visualizes the entire border zone without the line. It dissolves the border into a bioregion whose shape is defined by the eight binational watershed systems bisected by the international border. Mexus also exposes other systems and flows across this bioregional ter uh, territory. Tribal nations, protected lands, croplands, urban crossings, many more informal ones, 15 million people, and much more. Ultimately, Mexus counters America's wall building fantasies with more expansive imaginaries of belonging and cooperation beyond the nation state. Here it is in 2018 at the Venice Architecture Biennale. In community stations programming, Mexus has become a powerful provocation for dialogue about a shared bioregional civic identity among Mexicans. Americans and diverse tribal nations who inhabit this contested space. Now, the final civic stretch, literally, is a visualization project called the Political Equator, which traces an imaginary line from San Diego and Tijuana across the planet, forming a corridor of global conflict between the 30th and 38th degrees par parallels north. Along its trajectory lies some of the world's most contested and violent thresholds. The US-Mexico border at San Diego, Tijuana, the most trafficked international border checkpoint in the Western hemisphere. The Strait of Gibraltar in the Mediterranean, the main route from North Africa into Fortress Europe. The Israeli-Palestinian border that divides the Middle East, emblematized by Israel's 50-year military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. India, Kashmir, a site of intense and enduring territorial conflict between Pakistan and India since the British partition in 1947. The border between North and South Korea representing decades of intract intractable you know, uh, Cold War conflict and China's accelerating militarization of the South China Sea along with Taiwan and Hong Kong. And by the way, Northwest Arkansas is also on this trajectory. Now, Visualizing the political equator alongside the climatic equator below here in green was an astonishing discovery for our practice because the ribbon in between them, give or take a few degrees, contains our planet's most populous slums, its sites of greatest resource, natural resource extraction and export, and its zones of greatest political instability, climate vulnerability, and human displacement. And when these parallel equators are applied to the Pierce quincuncial projection, you know, from above, the Arctic becomes protagonist with its melting ice caps detonating hemispheric conflicts through sea level rise, 
dramatic coastal vulnerability and human displacement. Really in the end, the collision of nationalism and border building, climate catastrophe and forced migration is the global justice trifecta of our time. But as we said at the very beginning, these dynamics always hit the ground somewhere, right? And are experienced by people locally in everyday places like ours. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, both Teddy and Fauna. Um, I, I think that John Fullen would like to use this opportunity before we uh, begin the Q&A to remind everyone about uh, the workshop that you have coming up on Thursday of this week. Thank you, uh, Robert and Fauna and Teddy. Thank you for such an inspirational talk. Uh, really extraordinary work. And um, the investment of uh, time goes into uh, um, producing that work and the commitment uh, to building those relationships is really extraordinary. So thank you very much. Um, we are fortunate uh, to have Fauna and Teddy uh, offering a workshop to all of our students. Um, there have been uh, email messages sent around as well as a note that was put in the chat. Um, that will occur on Thursday, March 11th. So that's this Thursday. We wanna be hot on the heels of uh, this extraordinary lecture. Um, and uh, that um, uh, workshop, which is titled uh, Co-Producing the City, uh, will occur from five o'clock until 7 p.m. Uh, on Thursday, and it is open to every Faye Jones School student. There's no cap on participation. Um, we're uh, anticipating enthusiastic um, uh, interest uh, in, the, in the workshop, and we want to make sure that it's available to anybody and everybody who uh, would like to take advantage of it. So um, with that reminder, um, please refer back to your email. Um, you can contact uh, Alana Massey and uh, Byron McCune um, if you're interested, and, and we'll get you information about um, uh, the workshop and, and how to participate. So with that, I think we will turn this over to Jayla uh, for Q and A. I'd yes. like to also to introduce, yes, we have two students joining us to moderate the Q and A today, Jayla Jones, fourth year architecture student, and also Gabe D'Souza Silva, both of whom are participating in the Political Equator Arkansas studio that Teddy and Fauna are teaching. So um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I might uh, kick it off with one of my own for you both, if I could, which is, could you say something following that amazing lecture about um, what is perhaps the most sort of inspiring aspect of this work that you do and what is maybe one of the most challenging aspects of it? Fona, you're you're muted. There we go. Um, I, I can I can take a stab. Really, the most inspiring is how much we learn from our community partners, um, and 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 how much that knowledge is able to enrich what we do as teachers and what we're sharing with our students. Um, it's a continual um, amazement at how ingenious and resilient. Um, um, communities facing scarcity and deprivation can be I mean, driven by a kind of necessity. But I think there's also a, a challenge directly related to this. It's, we've, we've been so committed to, to, to learning from, you know, and, and recognizing and documenting these bottom-up processes that that can sometimes translate to some that we believe these emergent bottom-up practices can go it alone without top-down public support. Um, so we wanna keep those two things going simultaneously. We believe in accountable public institutions. So while we're so like continually amazed by the bottom-up, that bottom-up needs support from you know, institutions and knowledges and resources to help scale up what is already being done so amazingly. But we, we believe in connecting the top down and the bottom up 
Um, so I guess they're two, two sides of the same uh, coin for us. Yes, and if I can add maybe a more selfish note for a moment, because it really has to do with our own work in the context of a more personal sort of evolution, you know, uh, in a way, I mean, we never imagined that we incrementally would be able to shape a very idiosyncratic practice. I mean, this is something that we maybe mentioned also for the sake of our students who eventually will go on to create their own works, maybe work for firms that really, you know, they will be part of. But at some point when Fona for, as a political theorist was a bit dissatisfied with her own field uh, and the protocols that really were not addressing issues of advocacy or even the more embedded research practicing, similar in my case about architecture that sometimes hadn't really in the kind of radar of institutions hadn't really uh, acknowledged uh, much of that uh, bottom up energy and even the sites of kind of um, marginalization and conflict, we began to shape our own practice. And, and finally, I think after all these years of uh, committing to this region, we have begun to try to, to achieve the, 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 the deep, how would I call it, the interface between research, practice and education, which is really, uh, really the triad of our love and passion. And we have been able to inscribe that project within the institution uh, in a way, a kind of institutional critique project uh, to infiltrate ourselves within the protocols of institution to reorient its, 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 its uh, potential really to address those issues. So in a way, we, we feel that we have created a practice that we always imagined, a practice of facilitation and mediation um, to really link what ha had been divided. And I think that lately when we have finally been able to build some of the projects that began with nothing, began with, without a brief, without a, you know, we never waited for the client in this case. And we finally were able to co-produce the client and, and, and assemble the kinds of resources that were able to take the projects to fruition. I think that has been personally, I think as both of us, I think it has been an incredible achievement. And that's the reason I mentioned it's kind of selfish and pretentious as a, as a, as a comment, but it's one of those things that takes a long, long, long time. So we are, we are at a good moment, Brian. That's, that's everything, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there is a um, question from Professor Fitzpatrick. Her question is, are there design practices in the US you know of that are not affiliated with the US universities? Um, who do activist-based work along the border? Uh, let's see here. So uh, design practices that are not uh, um, connected to the to the university but are doing work at the borders that's a question right if we know of them of, of course there are many practices uh, in some way or another that are tackling these issues I imagine uh, at different locations I mean uh, we we recently were in a participating of a project in El Paso where there are a couple of offices that are really uh, you know engaging these issues I mean I, I don't know how to enumerate them but yes uh, there are there are a variety of, of, of architects that really have been engaged in the border, well, obviously through a very different uh, set of issues and maybe protocols and processes. For us, uh, again, as we said in the beginning, it became an important as a issue uh, to really not only advance what we ended up calling, calling an embedded practice, but that really produced a more long-term uh, set of partnerships across the border to really be together in the long haul to create and co-produce and co-develop infrastructure, which is really what a uh, public infrastructure, which is really what we are doing. I don't know of too many practices, let's put it this way, that maybe, and again, I might sound weird about it. Maybe you tell me, whoever asked uh, this question, but uh, practices that really are situated uh, there, engaging this level of um, you know, uh, development or co-development beyond the wall. I'm sure there are many, but uh, everybody's kind of busy in their own turf. But um, it would be great to, in fact, um, imagine a kind of uh, visualization of, of many of those practices. But in our case, we are maybe a little bit picky because we are really, really at this moment, primarily in the last four years of so much tragedy at the border, really mm -hmm. in terms of our division and polar the polarization that, that was uh, um, sort of uh, produced, that more and more we need practices that really truly commit to the long term. 
I don't know if Hona, I, 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 I don't remember. I mean, obviously there are, the ones that we have more connections are practices that are, are really connected to the universities, no? And, and, and there are, just, just to say, there are amazing practices based in universities. And one of the things that, you know, there's increasing sort of desire to be connecting, you know, design, you know, university-based design work happening on both sides of the border so that, you know, universities are collaborating. Um, there's so much amazing work going on um, south of the border as well. I think I'll ask the next question. Max Frank asks, what in your experience are some of the best avenues for engagement and dialogue between communities and institutions? Are there community driven mechanisms which can demand accountability from institutions? It's, it's just a great question because, you know, the last thing we would ever want to convey in our work is that communities haven't found amazing sort of mechanisms to hold, you know, decision makers accountable to hold powerful institutions um, accountable for things that happen in their neighborhoods. There's amazing bottom-up agency that we, that we um, learn from all the time. But what we've noticed is that the, the most important ingredient, it looks like what are the best avenues, the most important ingredient in creating those mechanisms is trust, long-term trust. Um, some of our projects have taken a long time because we've had to do that kind of advocacy work and to push against zoning and to push against sort of punitive policies that prevent the kind of development that communities want to see in their own neighborhoods. And, you know, we, we, we're coming from the outside. And so it takes a long time to build, um, to build trust. And, but once that trust has been built, we've really been able to sort of play this sort of mediating function or this kind of um, facilitating role, sort of assisting communities, you know, assisting them to sort of, to push the knowledge that they want to reach decision makers. And because we're at a sort of powerful research-based university with lots of networks and social capital, we're able to get doors open that the community might not be able to achieve on their own. But, but really the most important pathway is forged um, um, through, through trust. And that's why sort of one-off projects um, typically aren't as successful as longer-term ones because that ingredient um, is missing. And that's why it's taken us so long to get anything built <laughs> because there's, there's just, there's been so much preparatory work in the building of a, of a sense of, of collaboration. And, and by the way, it's, it, it sounded strange when maybe I was mentioning that we don't know at least, I mean, obviously we could enumerate a variety of practices. I see a comment right now when they talk about Rene Peralta in Tijuana, who is a friend and we know each other and a lot of people are working on the variety of, of, of projects. What I meant was that I, I don't think I know of many practices and, and that's the reason it's strange to say it this way because we might be just advancing what we're doing as, as, as maybe an example of what I'm, I'm trying to get at. It's just that it is, it is extremely challenging to really in, intervene in the interface across this myriad or not only of issues, but really to um, curate the kind of, uh, or facilitate the relationship across the border uh, not only between the top down and the bottom up in this case, but a, a, a variety of curatorial projects that require cross sector, cross sectorial and cross border, you know, set of interfaces. So, so we like to situate our work in a very masochistic in a way, uh, rich ecology, as I mentioned, of, of social, institutional, economic, even uh, uh, in, in, in social relations. Um, so we are funding our own projects with, through our institutions and, and, and really in collaboration with our partners. But anyway, the point is that uh, in, in advancing what Fona was saying is one of the most incredible lessons for us has been how to choreograph this sort of meeting of knowledges. Obviously the, the core of our practice is to be translators and facilitators of bottom up urban energy in neighborhoods and carrying that knowledge to institutions, right? To knock on the doors in order for uh, public policy from the top down to transform, but also to redirect resources. But we have learned incredibly from our, our, our community partners 
as well as I imagine our partners uh, in, in, in connecting to what we are doing at the university uh, are able to increase their own capacities. So it's a, a kind of wonderful sort of um, a synergy, let's say for a moment of, 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 of those knowledges uh, meeting. In that sense, uh, and, um, we have been maybe at times critical of certain passive and neutral forms of uh, advocacy planning that remain really organized around issues of style and, 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 and packaging identity through iconography. And, and we have been really interested uh, instead in producing a more agonistic process where uh, between our community partners and ourselves, we really try to problematize uh, what let's say community design might be uh, by visualizing the critical questions, the kinds of conflicts, uh, the, the institutional deficiencies that might be at play that have prevented us from advancing a more robust project of inclusion. So the, project, the, the, the conversation, we call it the architecture of a conversation that we have maybe advanced with our partners has been the most, one of the most fruitful devices for rethinking what archi architects and architecture can do in places of uh, obviously of uh, poverty. And if I could just add one thing to that, I mean, we've been, you know, critical of conventional advocacy planning because they're so often hijacked by these sort of developer driven municipal agendas. Um, but we have also along those same lines been kind of pushing up against a, a trend within university sort of culture that, you know, as researchers, we have to take a very gentle ethnographically kind of sensitive approach to engaging communities who should be driving their own futures, the idea of community self-determination and so forth, which we believe in, like absolutely fundamentally believe in, but, you know, we were resisting verticality and creating a horizontal model where knowledge is meet. That means that sometimes the university and our community part, you know, the researchers and the designers in the university might sometimes have conflict with community residents. We may not necessarily agree on things. And we, you know, we, we actually welcome that. Um, sometimes one thing that we've, we've, we've noticed um, working in sites of, of, you know, of, of, of deprivation and ma marginalization is that communities sometimes don't have a full sense of the options and horizons that are open to them. Um, this is a function of poverty. This is a function of colonization that communities, you know, they, they're struggling for the everyday and so on and the options may not be clear to them. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, we've done as a de design practice is try to open up alternative possibilities that are being sold to them through advocacy planning and that are constrained by the everyday kind of struggles of, of life. And, um, and sometimes that brings conflict because there's trust over time built with our community partners, we've found ways to overcome those moments of discomfort and conflict. I, I am sorry, I just have to, I, I, this question opened up so many different, yeah. we, we don't want to suggest this is one directional. I mean, the whole project mm -hmm. is bi-directional. Yeah. What we what we are maybe trying to say for a moment is that there has been a, a, a kind of mythology about community-based design, where architects have to come to communities obviously to listen, which is fundamental. But then sometimes there is fear to really convey and project imaginations that maybe the community might benefit in, uh, once there is the open dialogue about also the architect being humble enough to understand that the knowledges embedded in those everyday practices within communities could be inc incredible devices for rethinking spatialization. So what we're talking is about the, pro the problematic and very challenging exchange of knowledges, but where architects still put on the table our professional skills, our ways of conceptualizing and approaching you know, uh, these issues. So it's not just going to the office to do a little facade for a building that should look like a Mexican pyramid in order to satisfy some level of, you know, stylistic dimension that seemingly might be the respectful gesture. We have had incredible uh, interfaces or exchanges with our community partners where we have even questioned the very definition of identity within communities. But again, that unfortunately at times it is packaged through uh, just simple minded icono iconography. And we began to open up incredible dialogues about how the everyday practices in communities, their knowledges, the way people negotiate boundaries and resources and spaces in the community, 
uh, building an affordable sort of granny flat in the back that might be non-conforming but nevertheless powerful, or plugging an informal economy into a garage, activating the public realm in the neighborhood to produce an alternative economy, et cetera. It is those knowledges that also could be amplified as important elements of an identity and a process. That's what I mean. It's, it's an exchange of knowledge that often needs more curatorial, deliberate kind of curatorial uh, in, um, sort of choreography. Uh, and often is not the case in advocacy planning where there is a, a hierarchical kind of at times division between um, you know, these different uh, entities and so on. So it's a difficult topic, but I just wanted to uh, further explain that because it's not just to say that we are saying that communities don't have imaginations or you know, it's just sometimes the, the certain aspects, conditions are naturalized because maybe there might not be connection to other possibilities, particularly in terms of architecture. But obviously the community has incredible knowledges. That's the foundation of our practice uh, and how to engage those knowledges to rethink the profession, I think is fundamental for us. Okay, so this is the last question. And um, you've kind of been talking about uh, collaboration and co-producing a client and um, bringing communities together. Um, Hunter asks, uh, how would you recommend that translation in Northwest Arkansas and maybe other areas um, along that border that you have demonstrated? Well, for now, you want to, I was- well, you, can, you can take that one. You can take that one. No, it, it, you know, in, in actually when Fona mentioned during the talk uh, that Arkansas, obviously Northwest Arkansas is in, in the trajectory of the political equator, that I don't mean to suggest that, you know, the, the place is just, uh, how would I call it, um, written by the same sort of global, you know, political violence or the kinds of very, very dramatic sort of uh, uh, conditions that really are transforming our wor uh, the world at this very moment in terms of the crisis, but they might not be noticeable, but I think every city for that matter really contains the same, the same at, at times the same sort of dynamics. And so we just wanted to bring into our conversation with the students really the recognition that maybe some aspects of urban conflict, some aspects of obviously inequality, the, the lack of, uh, you know, the sort of the distribution the on, on even distribution of resources, uh, social, environmental, economic, uh, the kind of lack and, and gap between, uh, you know, institutions and, 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 and publics and communities. And the many crises that really have characterized uh, uh, really our, 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 our condition at this very moment might be reproduced, in, it's reproduced in many cities. And we just wanted to open up the question about with the students about uh, opportunities that exist in a place uh, like, like Northwest Arkansas, where there's amazing institutions like obviously your own un university, uh, uh, but also incredible uh, philan philanthropy, uh, a lot of community activism, uh, a variety of entities, agencies, again, institutions that we as architects could begin to maybe act uh, as, as, as mediators and facilitators of a new type of civic conversation to tackle, in fact, those issues of, of, uh, of, of crisis. And, and so that's pretty much the, the idea. And, and, and for us, it's been essential because we are, basically we are sharing with, with our students the, our own practice and our own desires, our own aspirations and passions. That's all we can do. And we have forever, because we live in a place of conflict where it's maybe more visible, okay? But we have forever uh, believed that urban conflict is a creative tool, that if we were just to, to really visualize the, the conditions themselves that have produced a lot of havoc, a lot of the crisis itself, if we could visualize those conditions and make them our material for designing and redesigning and reorganizing resources, institutional protocols, and even the spaces of the city to be a lot more inclusive, that's, that's, I think, what we are trying to really target a bit in, in Arkansas, in Northwest, North, Northwest Arkansas with our students. It's a reflection on what can be done to intervene, obviously, uh, 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 at this very moment when I think it's urgent to begin constructing new forms of solidarity, collaboration, and empathy. That's, that's pretty much uh, what we're pursuing with, in the studio.
I don't know if I answered the question. I, I, I hope I did. <laughs> you did, was, yeah. You did, and you know, the, the question was really also asking about the ability to translate or to carry, you know, successful models from one context to another context. And this is one of the reasons why we've really been encouraging our students to understand process. Like you can see really wonderful projects that have emerged in different cities. And there's a tendency to say, well, I wanna do that, you know, here. So the key is to understand the process and how it works because how that process manifests is gonna obviously vary from context to context, but you can learn from the key sort of commitments and see how that might manifest in another, in another place. Anyway. I think that's uh, perhaps an ideal note to wrap up this conversation on and a, a really nice segue to allow me to again remind the students about the workshop coming up on Thursday from 5 to 7 p.m. Please send me an email if you'd like to participate. Uh, and, and there too, I'd like to thank Brian for all the work that you're doing this semester uh, with uh, Fauna and Teddy in the studio. I'd like to uh, thank uh, John Folan for recruiting uh, Teddy and Fauna uh, to be with the school. And we will hold out hope that you can be with us in person uh, as all events progress. Uh, but uh, two observations perhaps relevant to the work you're doing and its relationship to uh, us here in Arkansas. Uh, everything that you have highlighted, your work in housing, your work in community building, your work in resiliency, your work in food equity, your work in social justice. Those are issues as much for us in Northwest Arkansas as they were, are anywhere in the world. I, I'm quite sure that's part, part of your argument. And this is exactly why you are with us and why we're so grateful for um, uh, the wisdom that you're bringing to the school. Um, and, and it will be, I think, important to understand and, uh, and look at the outcomes of the workshop to see, in fact, precisely how we as a region are situated along that equator, on what terms. The other thing I, I wanted to recognize, there was a wonderful slide amongst the many that you showed of a section of the wall which had been somehow emblazoned with the word empathy. So word that Teddy just used now in his response. Um, and it's my belief that if anything, an education in design is an education in empathy. Um, it begins and hopefully ends in that, uh, with that quality. But what's fascinating to me is that you began with a, a title proposing a kind of unwalling uh, um, process and even a, a dissolution of boundaries uh, to achieve a greater porosity and greater understanding, greater productivity. There's this dynamic at play, which you surely have noticed between the idea of unwalling, of dissolving, of atomizing, and at the same time of building and of building up and of uh, creating a, another type of substance. It's very alchemical in a way uh, that uh, you're building knowledge, uh, you're building community, you're building identity, you're building citizenship. Uh, and so this is architecture too, um, in its most fundamental shape and form and design in its most fundamental shape and form. And I thank you for the, all of the inspiration, but truly for the work that you are doing, which is exemplary for us all anywhere that we are living and practicing. So thank you. Peter, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. With that, we have uh, hit our 5.30 mark uh, quite well, and I want to thank everyone for listening in um, and for staying with us through the question and answer. We've had two great students, uh, Jayla and Gabe, uh, as our moderators. Uh, again, examples of the future uh, in design all together, <laughs> and uh, thank you both. Everyone, uh, be safe, be well. And uh, we will be uh, here again next Monday with the first of our two-part piggybacking, sim piggybacking symposium. Uh, and we look forward to that. Thanks so much and good night. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Take Thank care. Bye-bye. See you on Thursday. <laughs>